Center. And the Shoreline team are at it again. A part has start an incredible journey. For the next 13 weeks, we'll be exploring our coast. 2,600 kilometers from the mouth of the Hunnic River to the border with Mozambique. It's our second time around, and though I have seen some of the most beautiful sights in the world, I've never seen it quite this way. <laughs> And just as before, New Jack and I will be in good company as we travel along with our team of experts, specialists in their respective fields. Marine biologist Eleanor Yeld introducing us to the life that teams above and below the water. Just up ahead is a mussel farm where we'll be docking the boat to take a look. Oh my goodness, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. It's a baby octopus. I've never seen such a tiny one. Historian Nomolanga Machize, dusting off the fascinating stories that bind us together. Okay, it looks like I have found a rock and another rock. My swelling needs to be a little bit bolder. I'm glad none of those people are here to see me do it like this. And archaeologist Gavin Whitelaw unearthing clues to our ancient past that help us to better understand our present. What's astonishing about Blombosta is its age. The stuff is 75,000 years old. What's left is an archaeological treasure trove. We'll be exploring magical places, discovering new vistas and landscapes that eluded us the first time. We'll be taking time to wander new bluffs and marvel at new wonders. Completely different and spectacularly beautiful. Some off the beaten track. Some mysterious. Some serene. And some with just a hint of danger. His company sent him out here to this bleak, unnamed spit of rock. It's like being in some kind of a crazy Alice in Wonderland meets Dr. Zeus world. We'll meet new people and get a fascinating insight into the diverse cultures and communities that share this coast. We'll discover the people who live here, who work here, so out of is a yellow blood. Yeah, it was your blood. But the heart was so lift. But why did the heart? I did the heart. I did the most of them. I hope I can grow old gracefully. You know, I'll tell you what, it's tough, eh? Maybe I might become the queen of the chocolate industry. And those who study humankind's link to our extraordinary shoreline. What you found here has literally changed the way we see human origins. We're now pushing back early human cognitive abilities to at least 100,000, and I believe way beyond 100,000. And we meet the people who continue the ancient traditions that have shaped this coast for centuries. <laughs> It's going to be a new adventure along an ancient shoreline. A spectacular trek with new sights and sounds. I've never experienced anything like this before. It's pretty spooky in here, really. This is quite remarkable. As we delve deep into stories and secrets of our coast, it's time to jump right in. Woo! <laughs> it's on... Like a summer day. Gosh. So here's to clear skies and spectacular views as we embark on our second grand journey around South Africa's greatest treasure, our ever-changing, eternally beautiful shoreline.
This will be a journey around our shoreline and through our shared history and humanity. It will also be a journey through time. So before we start, we are going to be exploring some of those vast time frames and ancient rhythms that have brought us to this point. For most of us, the age of the Earth seems almost incomprehensible. Even our own history seems incredibly ancient to us. But to get some perspective, imagine that the Earth was formed just one day ago. If the Earth is 24 hours old, then we modern humans have been around for just 1.3 seconds. Here in Table Bay stands a concrete reminder of that great sweep of time. It's easy to see why Table Mountain is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. The Khoisan named it Hurik Kwahu, the mountain in the sea. And in African myth, it was a sentinel standing here forever to guard against a huge sea serpent. To us humans, geological time can seem like forever. But even this ancient mountain hasn't been here for all eternity. In fact, Table Mountain and the forces that shaped it are relatively new phenomena. About 200 million years ago, a mighty collision was coming to an end. Two ancient continents had smashed into each other, a global head-on crash millions of years in the making. That slow impact forced the bedrock to fold or bend back on itself, forming a range of mountains known as the Cape Fold Belt. Even now, one can still see evidence of that violent impact in the beautiful curves and folds in many of the mountainsides in the Western Cape. But incredibly, Table Mountain looks very different from the rest of the Cape Fold Belt. Well, for one thing, it isn't really folded, but is in fact quite flat. Now, the reason for this takes us back to, well, between 500 and 330 million years, to when the sediments that make up Table Mountain were being slowly deposited, layer upon layer. And in a few places, sediments were laid down directly over very hard, very large Cape granite. And it was in fact these massive layers of granite that protected Table Mountain from the immense compression forces that form the Cape Fold Belt. There's no better place to see these remarkable events than at Chapman's Peak, where the road follows the interface between the solid granite below and the sedimentary rock above. But just as these uprisings formed over millennia, they also started eroding away again. This bottle of water here represents hundreds of millions of years of rain, flood, wind and fire. The elements in a bottle. Bring them together and let's see what happens. The softer sedimentary layers are eroded away. Revealing what we see here. The leftovers of hard peninsula sandstone. Not quite Table Mountain, but you get the picture. But what of the future? Well, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that Table Mountain is crumbling. Yes, it's coming apart. But the good news is that it'll be another 50 to 100 million years before it's gone. Rising sea levels are a political hot potato these days thanks to the raging debate around humankind's contribution to climate change. But of course, the fact is, sea levels have been rising and falling for millennia. Earth warms and cools in great cycles of roughly 100,000 years. During the cold snaps, called periods of glaciation, the polar regions freeze, trapping huge amounts of water, lowering sea levels and exposing large swatches of coastal plain. When the planet warms up again, the ice caps release water and oceans begin to creep upwards again. This is the CBD of the Cape Town suburb of Rondebosch. Just another busy suburban street on the Cape Peninsula. But two million years ago, not only was Rondebosch not Rondebosch, but the peninsula did not exist. It was an island, Rondebosch, two million years ago. It all looks strangely familiar with plant and animal life, but between here and the rest of Africa, there are about 15 kilometers of Atlantic Ocean. We can easily imagine the Cape looking very different two million years ago. 
But just 20,000 years ago, this shoreline looked even more different. The people who lived here may have looked more or less identical to us, but their coast would have been unrecognizable to us today. To see why, I'm going to borrow a very modern vantage point. About 20,000 years ago, much of the Northern Hemisphere was locked in a so-called ice age. With huge volumes of water frozen solid, sea levels had reached the lowest point for thousands of years. And down here in the Cape, that resulted in a landscape that was very unlike what we know today. Table Bay did not exist. In fact, the shoreline was about 35 kilometers west from where it is now. And Robben Island formed part of that landmass. In fact, this entire region would have been one huge plain of grass. The oceans have risen and fallen, and will continue to do so long after our species is gone. It may seem daunting to us in our fragile cities clinging to the shore, but it is also a timely reminder that the planet's rhythms don't take much notice of human needs. The cycles of our planet can seem too great for us to fully imagine. The idea of a million years boggles most minds. Even a hundred thousand years can seem vague. But there is another cycle that rules the seas and takes place at a far more human pace. Twice a day to be exact. The rise and fall of the tides is such an integral part of our lives that we even record and include them in our daily weather reports. But what actually causes this ebb and flow? The answer is floating in the sky above us. The moon is a lifeless ball of barren rock and dust. But by some strange twist, it has allowed life on Earth to flourish. Not only does it keep our planet steady on its rather wobbly axis, but it also governs the tides, the twice daily inhalations and exhalations that endlessly renew life on the shoreline. But how does the moon govern our tides? The easy answer, of course, is gravity. Or more precisely, the moon's gravitational force on the Earth. Now, let's for a moment pretend that the balloon is the Earth and this is the moon. And what happens is, as the moon orbits around the Earth, exerting its magnetic force on the planet, it draws all the water in our oceans towards itself. Now, this sounds simple enough, but there's a catch, because when it's high tide over here, and all the water has been pulled toward the moon, it should follow that the other side should be low tide. However, when it's high tide here, it's also high tide over here. If I swirl this balloon around, the water inside it and centrifugal force causes it to bulge. This is an extreme version of what happens to the ocean on the opposite side of the Earth to the Moon. As we spin through space, centrifugal force pulls the ocean outwards, which is why we have high tides on both sides of the planet simultaneously. This side pulled out by the force of the Moon, this side pushed out by centrifugal force as we whirl through space. The tides have been instrumental in allowing life to flourish on our planet. And this is never more true than in a unique habitat ruled entirely by the ebb and flow of salt water and fresh. Estuaries are a place of transition where the physical, biological and chemical properties of the marine world are transformed into the world of the freshwater and vice versa, creating a habitat that's found nowhere else on Earth. Estuaries are unique but fragile environments. They're amazingly productive and they support vast amounts of life, from tiny microscopic shrimp to large numbers of wading birds. But estuaries are also important for fish, and not just those species of fish that are specific to the estuary, 
But large numbers of our marine species that depend on estuaries as a vital link in their life cycle, using them as nursery areas for the juveniles. Estuaries are fed by nutrients coming down rivers and in from the sea. But what do we mean when we talk about nutrients? And where does all this edible, digestible stuff come from? If you've ever spent any time on the west coast, you'll probably have noticed two things. One, the water is extremely cold. And two, that the plants seem to love it here. And you might wonder, well, why do the plants grow so thick here? Why do we get these big forests of kelp here and not on the east coast where it's warmer and you'd expect them to grow? The answer, of course, is that the water is saturated with nutrients. So, what I'm driving the boat through right now, it's essentially a rather chilly stew of plant food. The reason that the water here is so full of nutrients is actually the same reason that it's so cold. You see, here on the west coast, the prevailing winds are southeasterly. And that means that they actually blow so hard they push the surface water away from the coast. That water has to be replaced. And what it's replaced by is water from down in the dark depths, where there are millennia's worth of decaying organisms. So basically, it's like water coming straight from a compost heap. It's dark, it's cold, and it's nutrient-rich. Rich enough, in fact, to allow a few species to flourish in huge numbers. 50% of all life on Earth is found in the oceans. And that's just the life that we know about because the oceans are still largely unexplored. But what we do know is that the South African shoreline has some of the most varied and abundant life in the world. We owe that incredible richness and diversity to our two great currents, which have created not one, but two dramatically different marine worlds in one relatively small country. To the west, the cold Benguela creeps sluggishly north along the barren Namaqualand shore bringing with it the icy waters of the South Atlantic. To the east, the picture changes dramatically. This is a coast fed by the warm Agullis current, squeezed between Africa and Madagascar and funneling warm water down from the tropics. And the results are spectacular. A dazzling kaleidoscope of colors reveals that this is a kinder ocean than in the west. Back on the west coast, I'm about to explore a living symbol of its abundance, a golden underwater forest of kelp. Just as forests on land offer food and shelter to woodland or rainforest birds and animals, so kelp provides a habitat for dozens of marine species. Perhaps more importantly, its strong but flexible stalks and leaves act as a buffer against the pounding waves, diffusing the sea's destructive energy and allowing more delicate species to thrive inside its protective barrier. It's one thing to look at a map and see a blue arrow going up the west coast showing the Benguela current and a red arrow coming down the east coast showing the Agullis current. But it's another thing altogether, experiencing it underwater for yourself. The nutrient soup off the west coast is a blessing, but every so often it can also be malevolent. The Benguela current is a very productive marine ecosystem. Coastal upwelling brings massive amounts of nutrients into the water. Combined with sunlight, the microalgae found in the water can sometimes multiply on a grand scale, depleting the water of oxygen and depriving other marine creatures that depend on the vital gas. In a phenomenon we refer to as a red tide, the result of which we see here today. <laughs> 
starved of oxygen, marine species are in effect suffocated in their watery home. Fish have nowhere to go, but for species with legs, there is one desperate option left, walking up onto the beach, in a phenomenon known as a walkout. And this one at Elans Bay on the west coast was enormous. Entire populations of lobster driven into the eager beaks of seagulls by the deadly tide. At this walkout, police and army were on hand to prevent a health disaster from unfolding. But they also acted as conservationists. So these good folks here from the Department of Fisheries are doing the best that they can, trying to save as many of these poor rock lobsters as possible, moving them further down, down the coast to where the red tide is less severe and where they stand a better chance of survival. It's really quite tragic. On the third day of this walkout, 2,000 kilograms of lobster were rescued and put into holding tanks at Elans Bay. More than half were mature, which meant that the relatively slow growth cycle of these populations won't be too badly interrupted. Of course, the sad reality is that as, as much as they're trying to save as many of these, of these lobster, not all of them are going to make it. For example, the shy shark, it's still breathing at the moment, but uh, it's not going to survive. So uh, again, it's very tragic. Red tides are a natural phenomenon, but the carnage they bring can still appear shocking to us. Well, you guys still have a long way to go to get to this. And thanks to today's operation, they might well stand a chance. So, into the crate they go. We rarely see the ocean culling her own on so grand a scale. Still, one wonders whether human intervention in a natural phenomenon such as this is an entirely bad thing. Our country has one of the most diverse populations in the world. For centuries, it's been a meeting place for people of different cultures and languages, all of which have contributed to a fascinating variety today. But we have a far more ancient human story preserved in the DNA of some South Africans. To find out more, I've come to see Himla Sudyal at Pinnacle Point near Mossel Bay. It's an appropriate place because caves at Pinnacle Point contain archaeological deposits from people who lived here more than 160,000 years ago. We're getting increasingly used to the idea that Africa is the sort of cradle of humankind. In fact, we've got a cradle of humankind in Gauteng. What do the genetics tell us? Genetic data, when you explore it in all living people today, shows quite convincingly that the modern gene pool originated in Africa. Where in Africa, well, Southern Africa is a good candidate because people indigenous to this area, like the San and the Khoi, harbor the oldest genetic signatures found in humans today. And isn't it wonderful that right here on our doorstep are the answers to this very epic question of where did we originate? What does the genetic evidence tell us about Africa? If we imagine a tree, on a tree, we have many, many leaves. And there's some leaves that are placed on peripheral branches and other leaves that are placed on much deeper branches. By deeper, I mean closer to the trunk. Okay. Mm. People of African origin are placed on the deeper branches of the tree. Closer to the trunk. Those branches closer to the trunk. And as you go out of Africa, one of the branches from Africa gives way to a branching a fork in the tree that we see part of which represented in Europe, part of which represented in Asia, and within the Asian branch we have sub-branches into the Americas. So in actual fact, the movement of humans can also be explained by this tree, where the thinning out of the tree represents that subset of humans who left Africa 
probably in the vicinity of between 200 and 2,000 individuals who eventually gave rise to the gene pool we see outside of Africa. We have modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, emerging around 200,000 years ago. And then there's a population crash at 70,000, moving out into the rest of the world. It's not surprising that we're all so similar, genetically speaking. We're a very young species. You know, we normally joke that if you take any two people's DNA and you mix it together, there's about 99.9% .9 similarity. In the same breath, if you take a human's DNA and a worm's DNA, 66% of it would be the same. And we can get even better. You can take a human's DNA and mix it with a daffodil, a plant, and 33% would be the same. So does it make us one-third daffodil and two-third worm? How do you see it sort of panning out in, in the end? Well, I mean, it brings us back to this kind of exotic place. You know, we, we can sit on this rock yeah. and you can just imagine 150,000 years, people moving, walking around yeah. these other rocks, feeding off the ocean, shellfish. Yeah. shellfish, bringing it to the inside, occupying the shelters in terms of the caves we see around us. Sitting here. <laughs> Sitting on this very rock. I mean, it is possible that somebody who has contributed to a genetic lineage to a living person today, sat on uh, this very rock. Listening to Himmler, the waves, feeling the roughness of the rock, it's almost possible to feel a sense of intimacy with the families who lived here so long ago. It's an intimacy that comes from a story inside us, from our genes. But what of their lives? These present a bigger challenge, but it's a challenge that archaeologists are working on, and we know more each year. We have a better idea of hunter-gatherer life in more recent times. Hunter-gatherer society varies tremendously around the world. But in a general model, it's women who do most of the gathering. And they, of course, provide most of the food. Men do the hunting. But it's not every animal that's killed that is hunted. If one kills an eland, for example, that's hunting. If you kill a tortoise, that's not regarded as hunting. Hunting is obviously of tremendous symbolic significance. Most hunter-gatherers are mobile and they move around their territories according to the availability of resources. At times they might disperse into small family groups, and other times they might come together in bigger groups, where they'll renew old friendships, establish new friendships, and get married. And in this way they can draw on these kinds of alliances in times of trouble. Clearly the hunter-gatherers, the sand or bushman hunter-gatherers that appear in the earliest historical records of the Cape were descended in some way from later Stone Age hunter-gatherers in South Africa. The later Stone Age is a period that begins around 25,000 years ago. It was a time of incredible climatic variation. People had to cope with extreme cold around 18,000 years ago, and then 6,000 years ago, temperatures were some two degrees higher than they are today. People abandoned the hot, dry interior and made for better conditions nearer the coast. Now there is a lesson for us as we face global warming. From about 3,000 years ago, we see people becoming more sedentary. Hunter-gatherers are making wider use of the resources in their territories, and the territories are becoming smaller. In some cases, we see that the territories are becoming more strictly guarded. Access to, to resources has been restricted to in-groups. Out-groups are being excluded. And then, 2,000 years ago, pottery, sheep, and cattle get added to the mix. But the great challenge for archaeology still in South Africa is to find out how exactly these elements get added to the mix. When European traders stopped at the Cape in the 16 and 1700s, they encountered koi herders who lived in large communities and kept sizable herds of cattle and flocks of sheep. As archaeologists, we want to know when and how that way of life developed. The answer isn't simple. Some archaeologists argue that hunter-gatherers in the far northern parts of southern Africa acquired sheep from herders and that the practice of casual sheep-keeping then diffused southwards to reach the Southern Cape 2,000 years ago. Then around 1,000 years ago, or perhaps within the last 1,000 years, Khoi-speaking herders arrived and together with the hunters with sheep, they created the herding culture that the Dutch recorded when they first arrived. Another scenario is more heavily based on linguistic evidence 
and this suggests that koi speaking herders perhaps from east africa arrived in the northern reaches of southern africa and they spread south into the western half of southern africa through a sieve of hunter gatherers mixing with them culturally linguistically marrying with them so that in south africa herders and hunters are genetically and physically indistinguishable this linguistic scenario also allows for the possibility that the historically recorded koi herding practices could have developed in the last thousand years or so. In particular, herders perhaps adopted ideas about cattle from the Iron Age farmers. Cattle were central to their farmers because they got married and established families by exchanging cattle for wives. To learn more about their way of life, I want to take you to the premier Iron Age site in Southern Africa, Great Zimbabwe. This is Great Zimbabwe. It's a special place. It was built between 1300 and 1450, when it was capital of the largest, most powerful kingdom that ever existed in Southern Africa. Around 18,000 people lived here, with the king and his retinue on the hilltop above and commoners on the level ground at the base of the hill. The kingdom extended from beyond the Botswana border in the west to the Mozambican border in the east, an area roughly the size of France and as trade connections reached across the Indian Ocean to Arabia, India and China. Zimbabwe was a Shona kingdom. Its people were descended from some of the original Iron Age pioneers of Southern Africa. To put them in some kind of context, we need to go back in time about 3,000 years to West Africa. Back then, farmers in the Cameroon, Nigeria region began to spread out into East and Southern Africa in what eventually became one of the most remarkable expansions by people of a single language family anywhere in the world. By the end of it, Bantu languages dominated Sub-Saharan Africa. These are languages we're familiar with. Zulu, Sutu, Tsonga, Shona and Swahili all belong to the Bantu language family. This is as good as it gets for an archaeologist in Southern Africa. It's goosebump stuff. I mean, look at this walling. Such precision stonework. Not a drop of cement. They've built a wall that's 11 meters high. They said there are 900,000 stone blocks in this outer wall. I mean, look at the thickness of this wall. It's unbelievable. It's such a privilege to be here. To see the king up there in his hilltop palace was no small thing. I'm climbing the ancient pathway to the palace and its narrowness here provokes an extraordinary sense of anticipation. One can imagine that 600 years ago people coming to see the king, it might have inspired a sense of awe and fear even. And perhaps they would have approached the palace on their hands and knees perhaps, looking down certainly. What an extraordinary place. It's quite magical. through the palace where the king lived along with a few wives, his ritual sister and some guards. You can get a great view of the town from up here and get some sense of what it might have looked like six or seven hundred years ago. Along with the walls you need to imagine thousands of houses densely packed 
back so that their roofs touched one another. And then in the territory around the capital, people living in ordinary homesteads, farming and producing the food that supported the capital. Farming, of course, is the reason why people expanded out of West Africa in the first place. People were looking for new lands, new pastures, new sources of iron ore. They were cultivating crops like sorghum and the millets and kept cattle, sheep and goats, as well as chickens and dogs. They were also metallurgists and extracted iron and copper from ore to make tools and jewelry. Later they worked gold, tin, bronze and brass. But iron was always the most important, mainly for hoes, for agriculture. And for this reason, archaeologists tend to use the shorthand term, the Iron Age, to refer to this period. Iron Age farmers first reached South Africa about 1700 years ago and settled throughout the bushveld regions in the northern and eastern parts of the country, where they found good soils, sweet felt grazing and wood for fuel. Later, about 700 years ago, some farmers moved on to the grasslands of the Highfield, but always they were restricted to areas where good summer rains fell because of their crops, so settlement expanded and contracted according to changes in climate. Underneath all this magnificence, all this grandeur, beyond the town, farmers lived in simple homesteads, working their fields, mining their cattle, producing food, and generally ensuring that the cycle of life continued. In the end, it was the homestead that survived, the rise and fall of kingdoms like Zimbabwe, the rise and fall of chieftains, climatic disasters. It lasted for some 2,000 years before colonization turned it into a pale ghost of itself. The homestead was really quite a remarkable institution, and it provided the heartbeat of Iron Age life. This is a journey around our coast. But what is our coast? Well, legally, it's the part that lies south of two lines on a map. But borders are entirely abstract creations. Animals and plants ignore them. The climate is the same on either side of them. South Africa's borders seem relatively logical, following two major rivers on either sides of the continent. But when they were drawn up, these lines represent the way in which colonizing powers carved up the land in their own interests. In reality, of course, these borders are not set in stone. We live on a changing planet and life moves. Just like borders, history can hide as much as it reveals. The history of our East Coast provides an example of how some histories can vanish from history while others provide the very basis of our present day identities. In much of the history written about South Africa's introduction into the global modern period, European empires and empire builders loom particularly large. And that's because for a long time, South Africa's official history began in 1652 and then thereafter followed by the exploits of the British in Southern Africa. But if we want a more accurate view of South Africa's introduction into global modernity, we should look about 100 to 150 years before the arrival of the Dutch to the 1500s when global sea trade was really taking off. And along this eastern shore, African kingdoms were trading with European merchants on African terms. Four hundred and fifty years ago, this northeastern coastal region was an international trading hub with its main port at what was then called Delagoa Bay in Mozambique where the Portuguese had set up station. 
One of the groups that came to exploit these trading opportunities to the maximum were the Tonga. The Tonga inhabited the region between northern Guazulu Natal and southern Mozambique. And Portuguese traders came to be very dependent on the goodwill of the Tonga kings if they wanted to access gold, ivory and slaves. And Tonga kings used the wealth they accumulated to consolidate their power in the region. The Tonga presided over the most wealthy empire at the time. They controlled the vast trading network of ivory from Delagoa all the way inland. Between 1760 and 1790, one of the most powerful kings of the East Coast would emerge, and his name was Mabudu of the Temba Tonga. Mabudu would come to dominate trade between Delagoa Bay and northern Guazulu Natal. Now, you might never have heard the name Mabudu, but you know its legacy. Of course, Maputo is named after him. While a powerful figure like Mabudu has faded from the realm of popular memory, one cannot think of the East Coast without the name Shaga coming to mind. Shaga Gasenzanga Kona, king and builder of the Zulu state in the 19th century, looms large in South African history. Although Shaga earned his place in our history books, historians have probed deeper and found that his reputation as a fierce and cruel tyrant is as much a product of historical fact as it is of fiction, specifically colonial fiction and the embellishments of oral history. There's ample evidence to be found in the diaries of colonial traders that Shaga's misdeeds were regularly exaggerated by colonialists and missionaries in order for them to take over land and people that they said they were protecting from Shaga. Also from the 1970s, what is fascinating is that historians came to realize that Shaga lived in a time of incredible change. I mean, by that stage, the European presence in Southern Africa was virtually entrenched. There was no going back. And there were many other leaders who were equally aggressive in building up their states who responded to these changes. In fact, what we find is that in as much as Shaga used his incredible army to build up the most powerful state of the time. There were also times when he had to build up alliances with those leaders who could repel his might. And as we travel along our coast, we're going to discover one of Shaga's most formidable contemporaries. In our journey around the coast, I will be keeping my detective hat on as I explore history and its usual suspects and looking out for the unexpected. So if we want to recover some modicum of historical truth, we need to become detectives. And that means watch out for red herrings, scrutinize eyewitness accounts, and sift through seemingly boring and irrelevant material. But also add some imagination and have a questioning mind. And always remember that your experiences and ideas are bound to shape where you think the evidence points. Four hundred and fifty million years of history and evolution lie behind us. Hundreds of thousands of species thrive all around us. And another twelve weeks of adventure and discovery lie ahead. We've explored the bigger picture, the grand stories of geology, of time and tide, of the dawn of humankind and of our more recent history. But now it's time to leave behind the bigger picture and go in search of the smaller gems of our shore. In the coming weeks, we'll be discovering new places, meeting creatures great and small, or just peculiar. We'll be trying our hand at new experiences, or failing at old ones all over again. Man, this is as hard as it was last time, and I seem to have gotten I'll just leave it to the kids and having a whole lot of fun into the bargain all the way. <laughs> another 3,000 kilometers, another three months of adventure and discovery. Join us as we explore and celebrate this, our shared birthright that which binds us together.
our beautiful and boundless shoreline. Join us next week on the West Coast as we start on the first leg of our epic new journey around the coast. You can also follow us on Facebook by searching for Shoreline.